Hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Shreya. Hello. Welcome. Uh, today's session is uh, writing for operas, writing for cities, but we'll see where it goes. <laughs> uh, on my side is Shreya Sen Handley and Anu Manjumi Gar. It's louder. Yeah, like this. Yeah, I guess. No, no, no. Uh, get your hand down a little oh. bit. Yeah, like that. that. That makes a difference. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm an Aurovillian, so I will be Aurovillian also now today. You are an Auroville. Did, did you know about Auroville before? Have you been here before? I came here twice 25 years ago. I have a personal connection as well with Auroville. That. But yes, yeah. I won't. Uh, I came here and I loved it. I loved Pondicherry as well. But it's taken me 25 years to come back. And hopefully I'll be back with my children uh, who have that connection as well. Wonderful. And, and see Wonderful. more of it. Anu lives already here since, I think, 35, well... 44. 44 years. <laughs> <laughs> I will just read out a little uh, something yeah, about yeah, you. Yeah, sure, will sure. know. <laughs> I found this text very good. <laughs> Shreya Sen Handley is the author of Memoirs of My Body, which won the best non-fiction book of the year at the NWS Writing Awards 2018 and the short story collection Strange, 2019. <clears throat> a Welsh national opera librettist and the first South Asian woman to write international opera. She has collaborated with WNO on their film series Creating Change in 2020 and a 200 performer multicultural opera migrations touring Britain in 2022. Her play, her play, Quiet, was staged in London by Tara Theatre in 2021. Her short stories and poetry, published, broadcast and shortlisted for prizes in India, Britain and Australia, also spearheaded a British national campaign against hate crime in 2020. Shreya teaches creative writing at various institutions, including the University of Cambridge. She is also a columnist and illustrator. She lives with her husband, two children and a dog in Sherwood Forest, England. Her latest novel is Handle with Care. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I'll introduce Anna. Should I, should I just start Would you like to say, start, yeah, yeah, please. Start with her. Yeah. So welcome to Oroville, Shreya. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. It's a real um, pleasure. Yeah. So before I start with Shreya, I'll just tell you how I met her. It's an interesting <laughs> story. We're both on Facebook. And one day I had posted something about Sri Aurobindo. And I get this message, you know, he's from my family. So of course that, wow, you know, <laughs> how can you somebody from Sri Aurobindo's family? So I wrote to her and then it came out that she is actually the great, great grand niece of Sri Aurobindo's eldest brother. Granddaughter. Granddaughter, sorry. Granddaughter of eldest brother, obviously, uh, Manamohan Ghosh. Uh, and as you, some of you will know that they spent their childhood and their education in England. And Manamohan Ghosh, in particular, was very good friends with um, um, Oscar. Oscar Wilde and other poets of that time. So he was a colorful character in his own right. And of course, for her to come here, she tells me, I'd like to come and know more about my ancestor. I find that beautiful. Somewhere he's also our ancestor. Of course, you know? absolutely. So yes. That's where it comes from. Yeah? So, okay, Shreya. So... You've been a journalist. Yes. And you've come up with quite a few books, as we just heard. Some of them have a journalistic flair. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Built from direct experience. Now, if we have this book, I'm just holding it up. Handle with care. Uh, travels with the family, <laughs> the children and the dog. Uh, which, I mean, I, you start with the story 
in during Durga Puja in Calcutta. But I think the highlight, of course, is Corfu. Corfu, yeah? absolutely. Would you just... like to say a few words about that first? Um, so yeah, this book was inspired by my family and travels with them, but also by Gerald Durrell. Uh, we grew up in India, most of us reading, loving Gerald Durrell and the Durrell family adventures. And um, so when the chance came to actually visit Corfu and go looking for the Durrell villas, everyone does that if, if they're a Durrell yeah, fan. And the snow yeah. white one and the strawberry pink one. So, uh, so off we went looking for them. This was before the children had come along. This was our honeymoon as it happened, but we were massively distracted by the Daryl hunt. Um, and we did find some villas. And in that, the last one we went to, we, we thought, you know, we, we were on our honeymoon. We were getting cozy. It was a deserted villa, but then we heard a human voice. Uh, and that shook us up and off we went, we got into our car and we left, but there was a feeling that there, our car was more populated than when we first got to that villa. Back to our own villa, um, there's splashes in the swimming pool when we're not in the pool. There's footsteps in, on the kitchen tiles when we're not in the kitchen. Um, and eventually I just had to decide that, you know, it has to be Jerry. Who else could it be? Who could have followed us back from the strawberry pink villa? And the most bizarre thing, when I got back from the honeymoon, uh, I found out I was pregnant very much by my husband. I'm not suggesting anything else here, <laughs> but um, when our first child was, was born, our son, he called his first teddy, Jerry. He knew nothing about Jerry. You know, it was, it was something, it was a giraffe. It was a giraffe, but it was called Jerry. And when my daughter came along 18 months later, bizarrely, she called her first Teddy Jerry as well, whether that was inspired by, by her brother or Gerald's ghost working its way into our lives. I couldn't tell you, but that's how it went. So that's the kind of story, not only of ghosts, but all sorts of adventures around the world that we've had, quite modest ones. We, we've never had an extravagant one. Um, but yeah, I think very relatable. So, you know, uh, that's why I wrote it. I wrote it for everybody to enjoy. Okay, so let's now come to this one day you got a call from the director <laughs> of the Welsh National Opera saying he wanted something from yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So that started a whole other adventure, adventure so to speak. So let's <laughs> yeah. get that story. Sure. Uh, it wasn't a call. It was an email that dropped into my defunct email account that I barely ever used. I'm a journalist. I was immediately suspicious. I did my research. Who is this Sir David Pountney? Is he like one of those princes who offer you a million dollars? And then when you open up your bank account to them, it turns out they are the ones taking some money from you. Um, but yeah, as it happened, Sir David Pountney turned out to be a knight of three realms. So uh, Britain, France, and Poland, a very senior and uh, accomplished figure in the world of opera. Opera was completely new to me. I had seen more, more Mozart and so on, De Fledemas, uh, and enjoyed it. But it's not something that we grew up with Western opera very much in India or in Southeast Asia, where I also grew up. Um, so, and, and they said, we read your uh, writing, your columns, your first book, Memoirs of My Body. We love it. We want you to write for us. We want you to be a libertist. I, I didn't even know what a libertist was. But... Um, I gave it a little bit of thought. I did my research in terms of finding out more about the Welsh National Opera. And the conclusion I came to, if you're Indian and you've grown up with Bollywood around you, whether you're a, a fan or not, uh, you, you've kind of imbibed that opera spirit already. It's going to come fairly naturally. Um, so I said, yes. I mean, it was, some people thought it was a huge and silly risk, um, but it, it was, it's been the most glorious adventure. I have loved every moment of it. Um, so would you tell us a little bit about the story, this whole thing of migrations and those two yes. Indian characters? Yeah. Sure. Um, so migrations was this very ambitious opera undertaking by the Welsh National Opera, who wanted to embrace the many communities of Britain, who wanted to reflect Britain as it is now, very multicultural. And so there were six of us writing a 
a two and a half hour performance. There are, there are five stories that weave through it, each of them reflecting migration in some form or the other. So there are birds, there are refugees. And my story, uh, the, the slave in Bristol, um, a very moving story. My story was about two Indian doctors who were invited over by Enoch Powell. Um, some of you will know about Enoch Powell and Rivers of Blood and what a fine man he was. Not. Um, but uh, he invites them over um, because Britain needed, you know, the NHS is a fabulous thing. It, it's faltering, but it's a fabulous thing. And Britain needed doctors from all over the Commonwealth to come and help out. Um, Enoch Powell was the one who invited them in. But when they came in, and there was obviously, uh, it, this was unsettling for the population that was already there when you had so many people coming over from the Caribbean, you had Indian and Pakistani and Bangladeshi doctors coming in. Um, the jobs were going and it was being pinned on immigrants, but actually there were a different sort of job, you know, altogether, as you know. Um, so, so then Enoch Powell and his ilk, he was, you know, he's kind of like the villain in my opera, but uh, there were many others like him. He's representative in a way. Then turns on it and starts dividing the indigenous population from the immigrants and sort of pinning everything, pinning the blame on everything that was going wrong on, on uh, yeah, on the immigrants. Believe it or not, this is a comedy. <laughs> so I've written a comedy about that, that era in Britain, 1968, um, a very volatile time. And uh, there's music and dancing. Opera doesn't usually have dancing, but my set, my, that's right. We wanted to infuse it with Indian and Bollywood spirit and color at the same time, retaining the opera aesthetic uh, of telling the whole story in song. So there's no dialogue in between. Um, and it, it's, it's a very moving opera on the whole. Mine was, has been described by The Guardian and various other, uh, the Times and so on as, as, as the sort of bright, colorful moment in the thing. But there is plenty of dark comedy as well. Plenty that, as the stage described, made them really, really uncomfortable. So my point was to make you laugh, but also to make you realize that, look, it's still happening. And, and that's, that's why I think we had this opera go on, on the road last year. So before I come, to the question of how you wrote, you know, the, the libretto, uh, just to get a sense of how, you know, the, how, what was the cast like, like how many people and what did it involve in terms of musicians and what kind of, you know. The, yeah. The so alongside getting librettists from non-operatic backgrounds, non-Caucasian backgrounds to write this, to sort of really make it authentic and true to the experience of migrations that so many of us have. The other intention was to open up in, it in every other way. So to have lots of cast members from all over the world um, to represent as truly as we can what each ethnic community felt and sounded like and acted like and danced like. Um, and, and to bring in opera audiences as well that, that would be from other communities to help them embrace it. So, uh, we started casting for my section of it, uh, called This is the Life. The Indian NHS doctor story is called This is the Life and found that there were very few opera singers of South Asian origin. So we then had to put our feelers out to the wider community, musical theater and so on. And we got in some brilliant, brilliant people. So, I mean, it's not important, but as a measure of evolution in opera, we, we actually ha had to look at technicalities as well, doing things differently. These were musical theater performers. They didn't have operatic voices. Uh, you might know that opera doesn't use mics. So um, you just have really powerful voices, but, um, I think eventually they didn't need mics. We, we got to a place where there were some mics, but they were throwing their voices. They were brilliant. They were dancing at the same time. That's an amazing feat for someone like me who can't dance. Dancing and singing and acting and bringing India and the Indian sensibility, the South Asian aesthetic alive around Britain for all of last year and being so embraced by people. It, we got a standing ovation most nights. So tell me about the process of writing 
the libretto? What, what, and if you could even, if you remember one or two, oh, or, you know, see, yeah, um, that's not important, <laughs> but just the process. Yeah. Just the a, scansion or whatever that required. You know. So, so the process was very much that, um, I, I think I write with color and rhythm anyway. I think that's why they picked me. They could have picked anyone in the world. Uh, but they, they liked my writing for what was already there, the cadence, uh, and, and the color. So that was there. Now I'd never written poetry, maybe five in my life, uh, poems. And, uh, so I had to write the whole thing in verse, which was another hurdle, if you will, but I found it incredibly freeing because I didn't have to remember anything I'd done in journalism. I didn't have to remember anything I'd done when I wrote my memoir. I could just start afresh and do what I wanted with it. And it could have every, you know, all, all the rhythm and color I'd always wanted to put into everything. And I think mostly have, but just that little bit extra, push that little bit extra out of it. Um, so, but of course it was a process and I learned so much from my opera colleagues, the artistic director, Sir David Pountney, our composer, Will Todd. Then we got on a brilliant sitar player because my section had sitar and tablas, so Jasteep Singh Degan. And we worked on the text and the music together. It was a very organic process. We would sit around in London at the Welsh First Minister's office and, and build this thing from the ground up with people who'd never written opera before, all good writers, many of them poets. I was in fact a non-poet. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I couldn't really quote, I wouldn't want to quote because I don't think firstly not, if, if I could have sung it out to you, I would have, because that, that's what really carries the power and the way the words worked with the music and, and the visuals. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, but having said that, you know, I, I sort of put aside my journalistic, uh, learning and all of that. I did and I didn't as well. I had to do a lot of research. I researched the NHS. I researched the first Indian doctors who came across in the sixties. Um, there was, there were waves of them, but the sixties was a significant one. I researched Enoch Powell's famous speech, Rivers of Blood. And, uh, and then I, and then, and then, yeah, and then I just, uh, had a lot of fun with it. It was, and because I think Karen had mentioned what a lonely process writing is, and it is for all of us, but with opera, like, like writers write in television together, it was a fantastic team effort. It felt so different and so wonderful. Do you have a question? Did you have any, did you have any references to your Indian? culture, Bollywood, or did you take a few things yeah. from there? Definitely, um, sort of the colors uh, and, and the kind of the aesthetic of some of the Bollywood movies growing up, 60s and 70s, the look, because I was very involved in every step of it, not just with the words. I gave them Indian accents so that, you know, the, the, the rhythm of the words that they spoke were very Indian. I threw in Indian phrases. Um, I, I drew inspiration from Sunil Gangupadhyay, who is a Bengali poet, maybe only in the name of my hero in Neera. But Neera meant a lot of things. She was the strong female character. And at one point, she is just the way it's rep represented. You know, you've seen Madonna do it as well, the different arms of the different dancers sort of flaring out to create this goddess-like image. So Neera was a very down-to-earth goddess, trying to manage the world she found herself in, trying to deal with racism, her husband's temper flaring up at the racism and so on and so forth. So she was holding down a lot of... Uh... Uh, would you say that the, the, the main theme would also be an Indian theme or is it mainly like a Western, a European, uh, England <clears throat> problem? Is it, do, you, do you see I, that here I think also? racism, colorism, isms, discrimination is obviously worldwide. We, we face it everywhere. I have, I have said that in some ways I have faced more colorism. I hate to say this, I didn't put anybody off, but in this country than I have in Britain, um, where I've lived now for 25 years. Um, it takes on very insidious forms in Britain, the racism. It's, it's very rarely overt nowadays. And sometimes it's harder to battle when, you know, it, it's not overt and you can't push back. Uh, but discrimination, 
which is what they face and struggling against it and finding footing and then finding that finding your footing is not enough really and that the cycle continues. This is a worldwide story. Minorities everywhere get sidelined. So yeah, so, so the setting is London, but it, it's a very, very universal feel, hopefully. And across the range of the opera, because there's so much packed into it, it's a story for the world. Yeah, we, we grow up with a certain prejudice, no, already. Um, it's kind of in the, in the DNA. It's not yeah, only like, yeah. because I don't, I can barely believe that people are like that, no? The, I know. It's very difficult for me to understand, but actually I notice also in Auroville we have these cultural differences and you're always moving from your own perspective, no? And then suddenly... Sorry? Yes. You moved to Auroville since you're bringing that in now. <laughs> yes, I would love to. Um, um, anu, then, shall we ask you a few questions about your lovely book? Yes. Or if she likes... Um, yeah, I... Um, I obviously um, find this a wonderful book of reference uh, and for me it's very important to keep reading about Auroville's vision and what mother wants uh, for Auroville and um, but, but sometimes it's a it's an enormous amount of uh, <laughs> uh, archive no and um, sometimes I have the feeling it's uh, she, she said so many contradictory things no uh, would you like to say something about that, or do you, does anything come to mind about that? Because uh, that's a bit okay. I can say that. I mean, the contradictory is always things that she said to people directly. You know, we uh, you know the transition. We need to make a transition from her what she has just said. Um, the Oroville, which was the vision, the original vision, stands. And those things she has always made very clear. What we see as contradictions is when she has said certain things which, uh, which apply directly to a person, for that person's personal moment of transition or experience or the help that person needed, which may not be a, a blanket uh, you know, uh, message for everybody which applies to that person's life. So perhaps, uh, Shreya, you'd like to take it on. Well, I, um, I, have st I started reading your book quite recently, and I have really learned so much from it. But it is not just a reference book or a history book. I found a lot of personal feeling in it. So for you, steeped in this history as you are, I mean, when you wrote the book, did you have to sort of burrow down further into it, or did you take a step outside and...? See, I never wanted to write this book. It was the publishers. I mean, they were behind me for three years. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I started thinking about it, even though I said I... I that was the first non-fiction book that I did. Uh, but it just triggered, and I was reading up a lot of things about Auroville, which has been said the standard stuff, you know, and I said, what's the point of writing a book? So much is already there. But the more I went into it, and it's interesting, it was the moment that I had to keep going to see my mother every six weeks because that, that was her last years. And she would ask me questions. And there were questions that really stumped me because as though I hadn't looked at certain things. And finally, um, what came to me is the missing link to all these stories, all the different aspects of Oroville was actually the city, which we had forgotten. And um, so then the whole book came together. And then, like you say, the digging became very clear what I had to dig for, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So then I kind of went not only to the what we look at right now, but I could go into the archives. We have a very good archive and also a lot of other material. So that's where I started to pull it together. I have uh, just maybe one last question. So when you wrote the book, were you at all worried that it might be controversial? Um, I never thought of it as controversial. I thought of that, that it was something that we had forgotten, which had to be brought to life. Yeah. 
And uh, the more I, I uh, sort of delved into the part of the city, the more rich it became and the more, like you say, the messages, the messages started to make sense. You know, why the city was planned in a certain way, why Oroville was meant to grow in a certain way. All that became very, very clear. So for me, it was never controversial. In fact, uh, once I had all that stuff, I thought I'd do a presentation. It was, my feeling was, hey, you know, there's so much as we don't know. So I did a presentation called The City We Forgot, um, which was very well received. I kind of did it over 10 or 12 times different people, but it also irked some people here uh, because they felt that I was stepping into something which, you know, we were not meant to be a city. We had some, by then become this eco-village or whatever. So there were, there were um, uh, let's say, resistance to that. Yeah. It still exists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, what you said about the, uh, the personal stories, mother speaks for people personally, and I, I realize that everything I read about it is also for me personally, because I, I don't always read what I read, you know, some things I would not see, like you say, for me it's a big surprise also, to see, oh, what is the city really, and the city is the main point uh, which can bring us together, and um, uh, I, lo I love it for that, because I can, um, it's such a joy, um, to, to find new, new things about it. So thank you very much for this work. Uh, now we are five years later, I think. It's Six, seven, uh, years, seven years, actually. And is there something you have to say? Like, would, would you add something to it now? Or? Um, that's a very interesting question because uh, by the time I finished it and it came out, that was about seven years ago. And uh, that brought me to a stop with my whole writing process. Until then, you know, I had, this was my ninth book. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> and right after that, I got pulled into, you know, working with the Town Development Council because of the, you know, I talk about the city and now I'm in the working committee writing reports most of the time. But what I would say is that what I see is um, within Oroville, on the one hand, uh, an acceptance and a deepening and an openness to discover it. At the same time, there is um, a very great resistance, uh, which is a little bit unfortunate because by, by resisting it, we miss, we miss the treasure, so to speak. Yeah. So. I yeah. didn't do your introduction, actually. Yeah, oh, no. I didn't do your introduction, <laughs> did I? All the wonderful things you've done. Did you do my intro? No, I think you forgot. But uh, the was it the, the the seed of light? The seeds of light. What is it? The light matter. The poetry. The poem. What what was it called again? Light matter. Light matter. I remember reading that. I still remember the moment. I really connected to that as a wonderful work. Also, um, let me see if I can. Um, yeah, because there's one part of the book uh, about resistance, the mother mentions a straining, no? This mm -hmm. word straining, which I, yeah, I could really connect to nowadays in Auroville, that we are uh, straining to... Straining to realize human unity. Yeah, and no, uh, to give birth to the city, actually. Uh, yeah. uh, 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 actually, see, uh, the book was kind of um, structured along the four lines of the charter, basically. So the first aspect is the aspect, the, the seed, which is the seed of consciousness and the work. So I start actually with the story of Mother and Sri and to see from where Oroville was born, that we didn't somehow suddenly land here and we did everything on our own. What was the purpose and the vision behind it? So I explored that in the first part, using the charter as a structure. The second one was unending education. So that's the unfurling of the different aspects of the town, whether it's education or culture, the pioneering part of it, and how people came. So, um, and the third one was, then I bring in the city, because the third one really refers to that, that material realization. And the fourth part is the culmination from the first point of consciousness to the realization of spirit and matter. That the fact that Oroville was created as a city, 
it was born as a city it wasn't born as some kind of extended ashram or something like that so uh, even before she wrote the charter i find that very interesting she worked with this architect whose centenary we are celebrating this year roger ange um so she invites him and um she worked with him for 3 years he made four different models and at one point he was asked at that time why did she choose you and he said maybe because i had the capacity to surrender so if you look at his first um uh, model which he did which was a very uh, right now one can say it was a conventional but a very worked out detailed modern city plan and apparently the mother didn't even look at it uh, and then he worked on another one which eventually called the nebula it had two concentric circles and she was very pleased she said you've finally got it you know so keep going and uh, the architect couple of days later he says you know i looked at th that plan again and it was no better than a military town you know in the medita in the medieval times and all very structured very rigid so he keeps working through and he goes to the next project uh, the next thing called macro structure which is on the contrary extremely far ahead extremely high tech um somebody asked yesterday about porosity so she didn't want the way he had designed that that it would block the center which is called the peace area from the rest of the town so finally he comes up with a model which would be very porous which would keep that link so like most cities have let's say the city center is always the commercial center or the entertainment center so here we have the center which is a soul and that whole area is the peace area and from there emanates the rest of the town so what we are going through right now is the building of the crown which actually uh, encircles each part of the city and in 1965 when the when the architect had his first conversation with her and she said you know like no cars you know the whole thing of whatever has happened with the use of petrol and whatever it has spanned so to have these very what she used a funny word she said hygienic cars <laughs> you know but i don't know how far the the electric car is totally hygienic given the batteries but maybe we'll come to another technology eventually solar powered or whatever um and that it would be a very quiet town it would be mainly pedestrian so it is very important that we build that central crown to make the city pedestrian struck me as interesting was that although your book and my book might seem very disparate as well as the talk of opera and one called migrations actually both books are about journeys aren't yes. they Yeah. they're both absolutely about journeys and the one i found particularly interesting yours but as well as orbindo's own journey mm -hmm. here yes. i i haven't finished reading your book cuz i've only just got it and i'm looking forward to finishing it but he's so human he felt so human in your book and i really like that i mean i'm here to discover my ancestry and it's great to know they were as human as we are yeah that is actually the point he was making that if look at me i'm just an ordinary person and i had trouble in school i had trouble this and that but if i can do it you can do it you know so that was very the, 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 that very strong message and sometimes what you will enjoy reading is some of his letters you know and uh, and the language sometimes is pretty profane <laughs> <laughs> and very humorous to that <laughs> you know when he's writing to some of his uh, disciples and uh, he basically says you know the whole thing is happening but you guys are holding it up you know but yeah. uh, and it's very uh, it's very graphic the details of what is happening at every stage and to be able to communicate that it's fascinating and last night i was told he loved a cigar <laughs> yeah so that yeah so that is another story so he he used to smoke um and uh, i think magandhi's son came and met him that was a story and said but why are you attached to smoking and he kind of just looked at him and said but why are you so attached to non smoking <laughs> and that was you know so but it seems a couple of years later the mother asked him that uh, maybe the indian um, disciples were a little bit confused because they were actually supposed to you know have a more satvic life so it seems he gave up 
that overnight it was over. Was, yeah, you know, it's not that you had. You know, most people give up smoking hundred times and don't succeed. You know, <laughs> so it was that. Oh, if only I could give up chocolate as easily. <laughs> it's how we do things, not what we do, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the process with Roger is also very beautiful to see. I think it's very important. He also speaks of that creative uh, process where he lets go and he receives suddenly the, the the thing that and he's fulfilled as a human being. You see, not only groping on his own but surrendering and 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 receiving the. I tried the other day because I had a friend visiting me and um, he talked about driving slowly. And then I thought of mother saying 15 kilometers an hour. I was hoping it would be miles an hour because uh, for a few days I did it. Uh, and it's so good to drive slowly. <laughs> Everything changes. And you can imagine this whole town will be silent, pedestrian, slow moving. We will, we will meet each other in a completely different space. That's what we experienced actually during the pandemic. If you remember, people were walking. People were cycling, very few cars and, and you know, all the, most of the cars we get into town are the ones coming from outside, yeah. the visitors. Yeah. So all that stopped. So suddenly we felt Oroville as it should be. Yeah. This very quiet and very sustainable and conscious kind of place, you know. So, and, and that's why it's important to get this road done because that triggers in, in a chain reaction in the planning many things which will make it possible. So that has to be had. Yeah. Talking of quiet, just very briefly, I wrote Handle with Care during the pandemic, during lockdown. And it's all about traveling the world at a time when you can't travel the world. And so there's a, there's an element of that, that kind of ethical travel necessarily came into it and, and is a part of it. So after every story I tell you about travel, there's a little bit of reflection. Um, called Pause for Thought, not terribly original, but the reason I did it was because when we could get to the bit about traveling with our dog, I desperately wanted to put in Pause for Thought, P-A-W-S for Thought. So, so there it was. But yeah, so, so it's a travel book, but it's, it's about modest travel, modified travel. Yeah. Um, yeah, talking about journeys, you know, uh, this is going to be an unending journey. I mean, it's, it doesn't start and stop with us. It's, it's going to be this continuous flow of the journeys of many lives. Actually, when I was asked to write this book and I resisted and I, uh, my editor at that time was Kartika from HarperCollins mm -hmm. and she said, write about your life. And then I said, why should anybody want to read about my life? You know, and Oroville is about multiple lives. So that's how I also built it. You know, initially with the lives of Mother and Shirobindo coming to the birth of Oroville. And once Oroville is born, it's the lives of everybody that is fostering it, that is creating it. You know, difficulties, the glories, you know, the joys, all of that. So that journey, of course, it's going through a big hiccup right now, which some of you may know. But after the, I mean, I think we'll have to pause, drink a little water, you know, let the hiccups settle. Yeah. <laughs> we have to carry on, you know, so that's, yeah. that is. Because it. the migrations also, I, I had the image of a cafe in a city or a small town, let's say. And the difference in the city is when, when you see new people coming of any color or any, uh, you say, Hey, how are you? What do you do? What, where, where are you going? What? You? And the small town will be like, ah, who is this stranger? <laughs> And yeah. I think we're in the process of getting out of that small town mentality, which I felt strongly here, funnily enough. Uh, and that what unifies us could be the city, uh, the divine. The... It's an odd thing. I don't think that small towns are always necessarily more no, I insular. Didn't mean to call it no, small towns, no I, I, yeah. No, I was just thinking about uh, Britain. And although, there, you know, one of, one of the first things that happened to me there when I first got there some 25 years ago, I got off at the wrong station and I was in a little village in Yorkshire. And as I walked down the main street, the only person walking down the main street, there were curtains twitching, lace curtains twitching. They'd never seen a brown person. Or if they had, you know, it was still a bit of a novelty. Um, and, and then a young man came out and very nicely very politely led me to the station so I could get out of their town. But there, there was not, there was, yet I wouldn't say there was any ill will there. I was just, 
I was just a novelty. Uh, in the city sometimes, because you're constantly living in difficult conditions, sometimes cheek by jowl, rubbing against each other, not always rubbing along too well, there can be more hostility. So it's a bit of, you know, uh, small towns can be welcoming, cities can be welcoming and vice versa. I wasn't trying to lecture yeah. to you or anything. It's, it's um, a good point. Uh, the thing is, we are still not a small town. We are just a little village. You know, we are going to be a small town when Oroville becomes 50,000. In, in the Indian demographic, 50,000 is the beginning of a small town. So we're not even, we, we're just about 3,000 people all to, right now. So, and it, it, we're really struggling to get to 15, 20, you know, so that has to happen because otherwise the experiment, which is what I really then discovered, will not take off. You know, we can have platitudes, but to have it in real terms, you need people. It's about people. I mean, if you're talking about human unity, with what are you going to build human unity? With people, right? And so these people have to be from here, they have to be from everywhere else. And that is what's going to make that little shift in, uh, let's say, at every level, whether it's education, whether it's how you design your your street or how you even write your book, you know, all of that. So I think what's happening now, you know, Hans, you had this question, your book came out like five, seven years ago, what's the difference now, is that we are, we are facing, um, we are facing, how to say, um, a moment where we have to leap. You know, we've come so far, we've moved at a certain speed, we've done things in a certain way, and we've become comfortable in it. But Oroville is not about our comfort or our achievement. It is about the realization of this dream. It was a dream, yeah? So for that dream to happen, that next step has to be forged. And what is interesting is that there are many people now who are waiting for it. They say, we've had enough, now we want to see it happen. We want to see the city. Not for the sake of the city, but for the sake of Oroville taking life, you know, for the world. And uh, so that is the transition. So we are at a very interesting and important transition. Hans, anything else that you'd want to ask or to ask? No, I, I, I was uh, surprised because um, uh, cities have a completely different meaning mm. as to what the galaxy model and what mother proposes. It's the opposite, actually. It's the welcome. I know that there are 50,000 men for this uh, township and 50,000 visitors, right? That'll always be there. Might be millions. So we also, the galaxy plan is full of art and exchange and interaction and research with the world and flow of people. It's a, a different man mindset altogether because uh, also the high density living uh, like I discover this with the, when I look into this book and into the plan and I discover all the time my discomforts and that I can get, get over it, you know. And this is why we are here, right? Get over our discomforts, our usual way of doing things, our ego. Yeah, it's a, for me that was, it's a discovery and uh, I'm happy that yeah. it's there. It's but what's your question to us? I don't know my question. I'm totally <laughs> like... <laughs> totally. Okay, then... Um, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah, um, see, the, the plan, the way it is, it, it's... Uh, yeah, it's called the Galaxy Plan. And yesterday there was Dr. Joyce and when he was talking about... It's when you have... It has a double spiral. And the double spiral has the capacity to rise in evolution and it has the capacity to go inward in involution. And if you realize that is precisely the whole story of Sri Aurobindo's yoga, that you need that involution to happen for you to then further evolve. Now, when we, we're talking about this whole thing about the supramental, so that's another interesting story. You see, just before the Second World War broke out, uh, the mother had invited, Sri Aurobindo had invited, uh, this um, um, architect called Antona Remo, Remo to build, a, you know, what a state-of-the-art place for his disciples, like a dormitory, because he had received um, a donation from the Nawab of Hyderabad. 
and he wanted to do something for that. But to do that, they wanted something at the top level of architecture. And when I looked back and I realized that they were running a test to see what, how, you know, to do something like that, how that would actually translate into a city. And then I found out that she had already asked Antonin Primo to make a plan of a city, and which he did. But what happened was that the World War broke out, the Second World War. So they completely stopped everything. And there are many stories. I mean, if you want to, you know, all their connections of whatever was happening day to day with the war and the, you know, I don't want to go too much into it, those interventions at certain stages of the war. And um, so Shurabindo passes away in 1950 and we, we, they don't really talk about the city anymore. And then she starts, she connects with this uh, architect and she gets a letter from Antonin Remo saying how happy he is, you know, he is to hear that. And that's the first time we hear that she had actually asked him to do something and that it was a magnificent, um, you know, plan. But she didn't invite him because, like Roger says, because maybe I was ready to surrender to what she exactly had seen and what she wanted done, you know. And uh, so that, so she waits until what in our parlance over here is called the supramental descent of consciousness. That was a whole work of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And it is only after that that she starts looking for land for Auroville, not before. So that whole uh, connection with the story of consciousness is at the heart of Auroville. And that's why we start with the, the Matriman. There's not a temple. It's a place to connect. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, does that? Yes. Sorry. No, not at all. I was just going to say, so the historical personalities in your book, mm. they, they really come alive. Mm. I was going to say there's some quite a few historical personalities in mine, but treated with a lot of mischief. So there's Bill Clinton and Sting and various other people. Mm. And it's... Uh, yeah, I think I think if you like tongue in cheek and irreverent, I think you should probably enjoy both books for completely different reasons. Actually, why don't you read something from your book? Oh, I wasn't quite prepared for yeah. it. I could read the sting bit if you like. Oh, I'd have to find it. Why don't you talk while I Sorry. find it? Okay. I'm going to keep it really short. Um, so this is Hey on Why. And we'd gone to see the book festival there, and Sting happened to have written his memoir around that time, Broken Music. Um, Fourteen years ago, Sting had been about to enter the big top to talk about his new book, Broken Music, when he'd stopped a moment to run his eyes over the crowd, waiting to hear him. In my early thirties, and still alive to such things, I noticed he was taller and handsomer than I'd expected. With the sun falling upon it, his hair seemed spun from gold, and without the bald patch that later became so apparent. His broad shoulders looked capable of heroically bearing the world's troubles, or at least several women at a time. His autobiography would suggest he'd tried both. And his piercing blue gaze was on me. We gazed at each other for what seemed like an eternity, till a guard opened a side gate for him and the connection snapped. It was then that I realized there was a very large ketchup stain down my front. Had he thought I was dying, did he not think to try and save me with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, an unusual staunch though that might seem for blood loss? I was a bit miffed, and with his book turning out to be as beautifully written as it was self-absorbed, I said to myself, there, you see, not a thought for anyone other than himself, not even when they're dying. And it was a good few months before he was allowed back into my good books again. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. It's very That's different. Crazy. Actually, I mean, yeah, it was a bit of a mix and match. I'll just read you. Just read you from the very first chapter, which is called The Destined Meeting. So, it began one afternoon in Pondicherry, just over a hundred years ago. On the 29th of March, 1914, a French lady, 36 years of age, stepped out of her hotel, still in her winter clothes, 
and made her way to number 41, Rue François Martin. At that hour, the streets of the little French colonial town were deserted. Two streets away, the Bay of Bengal lapped quietly against the shore. She had arrived in the morning after three weeks of journeying across the sea, and the news of their arrival had just been sent. She wanted to meet him alone. She was Mira Alfasa, and he, Aurobindo Ghosh, almost ready to be known as Sri Aurobindo. A few days prior to her departure from Paris, Mira wrote in her diary, I turn towards the future. What it holds in store for us, I do not know. She had set sail for India with her husband, Paul Richard, on the 7th of March aboard the Japanese ship Kagamaru. Surrounded by the vast solitude of the sea, Mira's inner gaze grew resonant. All oh, these silent and pure nights, her diary said, when my heart overflows and unifies with thy divine love to penetrate all things and embrace all life. I'll just read a little more because we mentioned Alexander David Neal somewhere with uh, Namita. So Mira was leaving behind a whole life, other life in Paris, her social milieu and friends and the groups she had started, like the Idée Nouvelle or the New Idea. Alexander David Neal, a member of the group, would recall those meetings and her friend in an interview. We spent marvelous evenings together with friends believing in a great future. At times we went to the Bois de Boulogne gardens and watched the grasshopper-like early airplanes take off. I remember her elegance, her accomplishments, her intellect, endowed with the mystical tendencies. In spite of her great love and sweetness, in spite of even of her inherent ease of making herself forgotten after achieving some noble deed, she couldn't manage to hide very well the tremendous force that she bore within herself. So this was an introduction actually of the mother. And this, the first, yeah, of her first, I mean, it goes on to the chapter, her first meeting with Sri Aurobindo. And uh, should I have read something of Sri Aurobindo rather? No, not the time. <laughs> the whole book. Yeah. I'm taking it home with me. Yeah. Thank you. Very beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, um, we are now going to have a small break, right? Uh, if there's any questions. Oh, yes, of course. Are there any questions, please? Um, yeah, we have time, so... Yeah, any questions? Please come, the microphones, please. Oh. Uh, hello? Oh, hello, man. Oh. Just, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Am I audible? Mm -hmm. Am I audible? Yes. So I have a question to Anu, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I'm uh, uh, six months new to Oroville. Um, and uh, most of the times when I talk to people around, they usually prescribe me to find my own way myself. And uh, the spiritual and material realization that you talked about blossoms from within. So I just wanted to ask, is there a fixed trajectory that has been prescribed? Maybe it's integral yoga or it has to be found on your own. You have to blossom your own, your own. Thank you. It is a personal journey. There is no, it's not a religion. And the Matriman, there is a place for that inner connection. And basically read. You know, there's so much to read from Sri Aurobindo, so much to read from the mother. And it's your own connection with experience. And it was definitely not meant to be a prescribed set agenda for, because each one grows differently. Each one's connection with the divine and their growth is different. So that is that tremendous, I would say, scope and freedom given to each one. But just that one knows why one is here. That it's not just another town, you know, you can be in Pondicherry, you can be in Chennai, or you can be in Delhi. 
but you're here for a reason and you're here to build an experiment. So just that you're aware of that and you keep your connection with that, but it's your own path. Uh, hi, thank you very much. Uh, that was a lovely talk. I enjoyed it. Uh, Shreya, ma'am, uh, I'm also a huge Jerry Darrell fan. So oh, I, mean, I really envious you went to Corfu and got to see all those villas. And I haven't read your book yet, but I'm sure I'll enjoy it a lot. So my question is about migrations. Uh, I know it's an opera there. I mean, for someone here sitting, is there any way we could ever get to see it? This is the question I keep getting asked, and I would have loved, loved to have brought it to India somehow. Um, but the Welsh National Opera has a particular area, it, you know, so, so it covers Britain, it does Dubai. Uh, one day, hopefully, and uh, because it's a standalone opera within the larger migrations framework called This is the Life, it may even be possible to just transplant that and have it performed here or something. I would love that. Um, my father broke his foot just before the premiere, wasn't able to come, um, so he never got to see it. And if it never comes here, he never might. And, mm -hmm. and that would be dreadful. And I, and I hope you, you and anyone else who's interested gets to see it too, because it was an amazing experience for me, and I think it, it resonates with people. Yes, I'm sure it would lose a lot if it was like translated into a digital format. So I'm sure it's something that we need to see uh, in person. I think it is definitely better on the stage. It's yes. such an immersive experience, but even digitally, I'm not sure that opera companies actually put out I full opera that. till years later. But, you know, I'll keep, I'll keep <laughs> encouraging them to put it out there. Yeah. And hopefully one day everyone will get to see it. Okay, thank so. you. And uh, my next question is for Anu, ma'am. Uh, you were talking about certain challenges uh, growing from, you know, uh, uh, a place of 3,000 people to a much larger town and eventually realizing the vision. Uh, so what are the kinds of challenges you face? I'm just curious. Um, basically, um, for some reason, there's a lacuna, which I, when I started writing the book, even I realized I had it. Uh, the basic knowledge about what this city, the fact that it was created as a city, uh, and what were the conditions and what were the quality, you know, all the different, uh, I would say, dim not dimensions, the different elements that went into creating the city and what was meant to be realized. I think that's a basic self-knowledge. If you live somewhere, you part somewhere, you have a basic self-knowledge about what that is. And I think that is something which needs to perhaps come forward. And uh, one of the other difficulties is because we didn't do our homework properly for a while, a lot of the new people coming in think Oroville is something else, you know, has another some kind of aim, you know. You have a few comfortable quotes, <laughs> you may even quote the charter, but uh, Oroville is very nitty gritty. I mean, when I came, this was, we were, bare, we were about 500 people and the main work was to build the Matri Mandir I mean, nobody questioned that. Why were we all there, you know, up on the scaffolding, you know, <laughs> I'd never held a, a hammer or a spanner before in my life, you know, but we were all there, we built it. And eventually it, it was completed with many more workers and everything. There's a huge amount of work which went in there. But uh, it's, it's a trait, I mean, <laughs> Hans will know, we question everything. So what, what actually was intended to be finished in five years, we took our time and we went through all kinds of arguments and finished in 40 years actually, 35 years. So now we still have to do the gardens. There's a whole plan for that place. So I think the sooner we come in touch with what Oroville really is, what it really is intended for, and that intention lies in the work of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. So it's nothing religious. They never wanted it to be religious, but they wanted it to be a field of experimentation. It was called a living laboratory. So not some kind of fancy utopia which is stuck there and then it dies as soon as, you know. So the fact that we are all here, people are still coming, we're still going through our, you know, process of growth, you know, inner and outer. So it shows that it's still a very living experiment. So that's it, you know, the basic self-knowledge of what it is, which is such a big treasure for humanity. Thank you so much. I 
have some basic doubts for me. Sorry. Louder, please. I have some basic doubts for me. So I wanted to ask it directly. Since it's a uh, future of our will, the theme is related to it. So you said 50,000 people will be here in, in future. That's the idea. So um, how many kilometers, square kilometers will you, it will be expanded more for the land for our will? It's uh, 2.5 square kilometers, 5 kilometers in the city area. Okay. And then you have the green belt, uh, which will eventually be 15 kilometers around. But I don't think we'll come to that because since we've delayed many things, there's, you know, the, the little villages around, which were around us have grown. So we can't, we're not going to throw them out. We have to grow with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, but the, the whole point of the green zone was to have agriculture to sustain that the whole story of sustainability is very inbuilt in every aspect of the town. So the green zone was really supposed to be the agricultural zone to support, you know, the food sense of, uh, su sufficiency for the city. And there are many other things like back in 66, when Oroville was being introduced at the UNESCO, uh, what the architect was presenting was that there would already be solar energy, that it would be a car-free pedestrian town, there would be rain harvesting, all those things which we are talking about now as ideal things to have for a sustainable, you know, city. So all that was thought of. So, um, yeah, does that, I hope that answers somewhat. Yeah, thank you. And, and then one more I have. So whenever I think of Auroville, it's full of trees. That's what I, I imagine. Like when we come from other cities to Auroville, we feel the chillness uh, because of the trees. So when 50,000 people are coming here, will that um, be a harmful thing for the forest type of thing? Like uh, trees will be cut down or will it be sustainable with the people also with the, along with the trees? Is there any uh, plan for that? See, Oroville is planned as a very green city, more than most cities in the world. Yeah, If you follow the plan, it's going to be green. But if you go against the plan, then some trees will have to be cut. But they will have to be, uh, again, replanted somewhere in the place where they are meant to be. So already within the city, there are a lot of um, green corridors, parks. We have four main parks. It's part of the design. There are green corridors between communities and things like that. So it will be, even the trees which may be cut down now to avoid, to allow this, this uh, crown road, you know, the path to pass, it will come up. You know, like a couple of years ago, when was it? When we had this big cyclone Thane. Uh, in one night, we had 50 million trees down. What could we do? They went down. But if I tell you there was that, that happened, do you, re does you, do you feel 50 million trees were down? They're all up, you know? So here, it, nature is such that they will all regenerate. So if we are a little conscious, even if we have to cut a few, they will be regenerated. The main, the main thing is that we have to allow things in their place. Not, you see, Oroville is a story of coexistence. Nature has to coexist with the city. You cannot say that it will only be trees and no people, then how will you have human unity? Where are the human beings? We have to get all these people to come. We have to build the town. Yeah. And yeah. the way it was designed with these lines of force, it was done so as to accommodate high density in order to leave most of the town open and green. So it was very well planned. Yeah. Thank you and uh, Thank I wish you. it happens. Yeah. Okay, maybe last one because I think people have to go for lunch here. Yeah. Thank you so much for your words and uh, uh, chief guest. And uh, really, I want to say thanks to mother because of one lady vision, how many people are working out. It's uh, just uh, still we are working. Really, it's a vision. It's now it's a realistic. So just, I want to ask only one question. It's very simple. Wherever we work, we always use to evaluate ourselves. This is okay. So the mother vision, how much it work out? Can you explain us? This much, 10 percentage, maybe 40 percentage. Can you? I cannot. Uh, I think it is each one's personal growth. And as that inner, let's say, growth will 
grow within the community, that will come forward. I think everybody is conscious most of the time that they are trying. They otherwise, even if people are say not very aware of the city, they, but they still there's something which has brought them there, you know, and something that they value, which is totally different as soon as you step out of Oroville. So I I have a great hope and a great uh, confidence that that will grow, even if it is not and. With as as, uh, as as I said, with three thousand people, with only two thousand four hundred adults, it's not yet visible. Mm -hmm. What is easiest to see are the trees. You yeah. know, we have planted mm -hmm. them. That's a great job. You see that. But for everything else to emerge, we need people. Okay. And there have been many stories, uh, you know, um, studies done. And the minimum critical mass we need for this is at least twenty-five to thirty thousand people for okay. all that to become aware. You know, because we cannot even build. The econo e economy we really want, the kind of education we really want, okay. the kind of beauty we without all that coming together. So we need to grow. I think okay. that we are at that stage now that it has to grow. Okay. Yeah. And uh, one more thing. It's okay. It's uh, your people, uh, Aurovillians, uh, well experienced person. They know we are, our status is like that. We are uh, this much, it's work out. We are finished and we will do it in future. So, okay, it's my question. When, how long you will take to reach, to finish that uh, our opinion or uh, view? Yeah, I mean, we are, there's a whole section in Oroville now. Okay. Which is very concerned mm -hmm. because the mother wanted the city done in 10 to 20 years maximum. We're 55 okay. years. Okay. So the more we delay, um, you see, one of the things, it's, this is interesting. Uh, Sri Aurobindo told the mother that Oroville is perhaps the best means to avoid the next great war in the world. And the whole intention of this consciousness was to forge human unity. Okay. Yeah. And, and this other, the growth of the real peace. That's why the whole center is called the real. Okay. So the more we delay, and I see right now, and that's for me, you know, when the Ukraine war broke, you know, that broke out, you know, I said, my God, we are not doing our work, you know? So it's, and we have something called the, we are sitting right now in what we call the international zone. And international zone has a great, um, how to say, uh, a role to play, not politically, but in a different way. And it really translates as, uh, Sri Aurobindo has this book called The Ideal of Human Unity. And if you come to the end of it, you realize that that is a culmination of what is happening in Oroville, the way they projected the city to happen. So uh, the sooner the better. I cannot give you any excuses. It has to happen. And the sooner Oroville takes those steps, the better it will be, not only for Oroville, but for what it is intended for. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And we can see.